All right, we can get going. Uh, our next speaker is, I believe, fairly well known to most of you. We've gotten a lot of information on uh, various systems, and uh, you got your MET courses and your oceanography courses, and uh, it comes down. We used to come into seminars, would look around at the title, and you'd say, "So what?" Well, now you're gonna. It's gonna. The rubber's gonna hit the road in terms of application. Stan Honey, a reasonably well-known navigator, um, uh, entrepreneur, engineer, designer, and he's even been known to sail a boat. <laughs> now on the East Coast, he's going to be chasing us in Bermuda this year, I understand. Uh, we'll give us a uh, little perspective from the nav table. Stan. Thank you, Frank. The, um, so <coughs> these days, I mostly navigate. But in previous careers, I uh, worked as an electrical engineer. I was one of the co-founders with my wife, Sally, of SailMail organization. Um, did lots of tracking, navigation, computer graphics system. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions about SailMail or SailDocs as well. Um, that's Groupama 3 on the left that we set the round the world record in 48 days, 2010. And on the right, that's um, Comanche in the most recent Transpac, where we got line honors. There's a, well, I'll go ahead. Um, Frank asked me to comment about the difference in navigating races on the East Coast and the West Coast. And it was a fascinating question um, for me to think about. Um, um, and I'll define the question not just as East and West Coast of the US, but as the kind of the East and West Coast of continents, because that's really how it split. On the west coast of continents, you have eastern boundary currents. We're like the California current. They're broad, slow, cold, relatively consistent. And they have eddies, but the eddies are for the most part geographic, and they tend to be quite repeatable. On the east coast of continents, you have western boundary currents, because it's on the western side of the oceanic basins. The currents tend to be strong, narrow, warm, they have moving meanders. Um, they have moving eddies. The examples that I've navigated in are, of course, the Gulf Stream, the Eastern Australia Current, which is a huge factor in the Sydney Hobart race. The Agulhas and the Brazil Currents, which are major factors in the round the world races. And I've never navigated in the Kiroshi Kiroshio. Kiroshima Current. But that's another example of one of those western boundary currents. On the west coast, the summertime weather is dominated by semi-permanent oceanic highs. In the case of the Pacific, you've got sort of the boundary between that and a continental thermal trough, causing the windy northwesterlies along the shore. And it tends to be fairly stable. In the Atlantic, you've got the Azores Bermuda high in the summer. And the weather in those areas tends to be less, less shifty in San Francisco Bay, it's extremely unshifty. The wind comes in through the gate like molasses, and it oozes around all of the bits and pieces of land. And there's dramatic geographic shifts, but they're extremely repeatable. Um, Long Beach, very, very stable wind, slow right shift during the day. Whereas in the, um, off the east coast of continents, you have much more turbulent weather. You have the turbulence coming off of the continent and you have a much more complicated mix of land breeze, sea breeze, and synoptic winds from moving systems. So it's a much more interesting place to sail and to navigate and challenging. The Pacific races are very repeatable in winds resulting from the Pacific high, so that many Pacific races are almost a carbon copy of other Pacific races. The Bermuda and the Hobart races are generally involved moving systems so that you get very windy transitions. They're called famously in the Hobart race, southerly busters or southerly changes. And then you almost always get a ridge of high pressure across the course at some point. So of, uh, of all the races, I think the Hobart race is probably my favorite because it's the most difficult to navigate. You're sailing you know, a north-south course. You're always having to deal with multiple systems moving through the course. And you've got the you know, challenging East Australia current to deal with. And the Newport Bermuda race is very similar to the Hobart race, except a little you know, one tick less 
strenuous in terms of the uh, southerly busters. Um, and this is, of course, my recollection of you know typical Hawaii races, you know, beautiful day in the sun versus a condition that you often find in a Hobart race. The navigator's job and priorities. Um, preparation, that I think is the single most important job as the navigator. And the goal is to have nothing to do the day before the race. Just you know, review the plan and the, uh, the weather. The goal is everything works, updated, robust. The instruments, computers, charts, communications, polars, sail crossover chart, calibrations, fleet tracking setup, everything running perfectly, no dramas in the last few days. The weather models selected, You'd be familiar with them, you've monitored them, you've characterized them, and you've compared them to the buoy reports and compared them to the age zero data so that you have a feeling for which models are running well. It's particularly important for the mesoscale models that you're going to use near the start and near the finish. The daily schedule and boat time for every update. So this is something that I'll always have printed out at the nav station so you know what time of day you can first get the update from each of the models that you're using. And of course, the SIs and the notice of races memorized and the hazards memorized. Not good enough to have printouts on deck. You've got to memorize that stuff. Legality. I'll spend a little time on this slide because this is particularly important and it's complicated. The Racing Rule 41C says you can only use data that's freely available. But freely available is defined very differently in different parts of the world. First of all, you can never use customized or custom compilations of data. Um, and so that would be, examples of that would be the routing that's done by Predict Wind. That's customized to your boat because you've selected a set of polars. And you could never get custom advice from a router. Um, you know, from Ken Campbell or, you know, Ken here. You can't get anything that's specialized for your boat. And that would be true everywhere in the world. On the other hand, some yacht clubs, like the CYCA, the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia, the ROC for the Fastnet, and the Bermuda Race, define freely available as means, meaning that any boat is free to purchase it. And there's no limit on cost. So you could use an expensive French you know, send boat service and spend $20,000, but it's still freely available because in principle, any boat could spend that $20,000 and get that um, unique data. But most US races define freely available as meaning free, meaning available at no charge at all. So landmines for the US, and there are many, but most US races are racing rule 41 compliant. So freely available means at no charge. And so the landmines where a lot of people inadvertently cheat would be, you know, lots of sailors have on their cell phone sail flow. And in a typical race in um, San Francisco Bay or off Southern California, you'll hear a crew member saying, well, it's blowing 12 knots at Anita, or the westerly just filled in at Point Vicente. Well, if you hear a crew member say that, then you just cheated. Because those particular reports on sail flow are only available to a paid subscription. And so then you know, that boat would have broken Racing Rule 41. So it's really important for the crew to understand those distinctions. Similarly, Predict Wind has very good mesoscale models, the PWE, the PWG, and of course their routing service, but those are also only available if you pay, so that they're not legal to use in US races that are compliant with Racing Rule 41, as most of them are. Sirius is another service that you can't get for free, so it's not legal to be used. And interestingly, there's no limitation on paying for communications. So, you know, Iridium, as we just heard, costs, you know, $60 per megabyte on average. But you, there's no limit on how much you can spend for the communications. It's just the way the rule is written. You can't spend anything for the data, it, with the exception of those rules that have accepted that. But the way they've accepted that is you, have to, you can pay for data, but you have to pay for data that any boat could buy and get exactly the same data, meaning you can't get custom data. So this is a complicated area right now in the sport, and it's slowly transitioning as more races start to allow data that's where you pay for, 
but everybody in the fleet is freely available to pay for it. Um, so be careful in this area. Global model examples. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because you've heard quite a bit earlier today. The GFS, in my experience, where people sail, meaning in areas of nice weather, the GFS has gotten extremely good. My recollection in the old days was that the EC model and the GFS would kind of leapfrog each other. One model would improve while the other model held still and then vice versa. The last time the GFS was by far the best was about 2010, 2011. Then the ECM model got better and has stayed better from like 2012 until now. And my impressions now, and I think most navigators' impressions now of the GFS is it's just as good. And I know that um, Joe doesn't think that. And I know that some of the analysis that you see online indicates that that may not be the case. But for sailors, and we typically sail in areas of nice weather, and we typically only focus on the first three or four days of the forecast. I mean, that's what really matters to us. The overall impression has been the GFS since the FV3 changes and other changes has been kick, you know, knocking it out of the box, that the GFS is doing a terrific job. The um, GFS, it updates every six hours. You can get it in quarter degree or 0.11 degree resolution. It runs for 15 days. It's worth looking at for eight days. It's worth taking seriously for six days. And you can take it to the bank for three days. One in six hours. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another one in six hours. The ECMWF is more complicated. It, um, since 2012, I think from 2012 till a year or six months ago, it was better. Um, I think recently, in the last six months or so, the GFS has been extraordinary. Um, the ECMWF, it hasn't been available for free since 2017. So up to 2017, you could find free public sources of it, which made it legal to use in all races. Um, it hasn't been freely available, meaning available to everybody for money, since 2018. And so right now, it's, now it's only available from private sources, so it's not legal to use in any race anywhere in the world. Um, and if you can find a private source, which if you're resourceful, you typically can, then it's only legal prior to the preparatory signal. But that makes it so that it's essentially not useful because if you download it before the prep signal, by the time you're squared away and you've started the yacht race and all the rest, there's been another update to the GFS. And in my view, and I think most navigators view, a GFS run from a more recent run is better than the ECMWF. So I look at the ECMWF when briefing the crew in the days before the regatta but um, you can't use it during the race and you never look back because as soon as you have a single update of the GFS beyond the latest DC, then you're, you're committed. The um, ECMWF is legal and it is available for visual inspection. And you can look at it through Windy, which is fairly expensive of satellite time, or you can look at it for free through the Predict Wind offshore app but you can't get grib files, you can just look at it. But nevertheless, that's still something that's quite useful because in your analysis of your routes, if you discovered that you know, there's a critical thing that you gotta be the first ones to this front or you're gonna make it through this coal or something, it's still sometimes helpful to take a look at the ECMWF to see if it shows the same pattern. And so it is still possible to get the ECMWF legally and for free, but only for inspection, not for a grib. It runs every 12 hours, it runs out for 10 days, and similarly, it's worth looking at for eight days, it's worth taking seriously for six days, and you can take it to the bank for three. Um, the other models, the ICON model is a German model. It goes out five days. The UK Met Office, the old no gaps model, now called NavGem, the Canadian model, Arpege. Um, those are all available, those are the UK, the ICON, no gaps, and Arpege, I guess just ICON and no gaps are available for free so that they're legal to use. 
but they're sufficiently less good than the GFS that most of us you know, only look at them sort of as a distant backup. But the GFS is significantly better. And so that's really the go-to solution these days. Mesoscale models. Um, Joe mentioned it, but I'd like to underline it. The HRRR, I guess affectionately called the HER, um, is extraordinary. It's absolutely unique in the world, and it's in the process of changing our sport, not necessarily for the better. But the HRR is amazing. It updates every hour. It runs for the continental US. And it's stunning. And it's legal as long as you download it from SailDocs or some other free source. It's legal to use during a race. And so you can download it every hour. And just as a couple of examples, the HRRR will absolutely perfectly predict every single day whether the Westerly in San Francisco Bay is going to fill from the gate or fill from the Berkeley Shore. It nails it. In Newport, Rhode Island, which is one of the toughest areas to navigate, it will predict within 10 minutes when the morning drainage breeze is going to glass off and when the sea breeze is going to fill in. And then in Newport, Rhode Island, as you all know, once the westerly, has, the sea breeze is filled in, as long as the wind is twisted vertically, you want to go left. But as soon as the twist is out of the wind, you want to go right. Well, the HRRR will predict that transition within about 10 minutes. So the HRRR is just an extraordinary model. And I think it really will um, change the sport of sailing. Um, and I think it has already in the US. And people are crazy if they don't find a routine way to you know, download that every hour, because it, it's really an astonishingly effective tool. Um, NAM updates every six hours. It's available in Hawaii, which is important. And some people actually prefer it to the HRRR, but I haven't. Um, I haven't um, found that. The NDFD, Joe talked about it. PWE and PWG, those are the predict wind mesoscale models. They only update every 12 hours, which is understandable for PWE, because it's initialized with ECMWF, which only runs every 12 hours. Nobody knows why PWG doesn't update every six hours, because it could. Um, those models are pretty good, but the fact that they only update every 12 hours makes them much, much less useful than the models that update more frequently. Uh, the WRF is a code base. It's not really a data set. But the WRF is a set of code that people can download. I think it's free. The um, people who run it include Expedition. Nick White runs it, Squid, Weatherflow, Chris Bedford, Windy. All of those organizations run the WARF model. They run it at various resolutions and down to um, a hundredth of a degree. Um, and the mesoscale predictions from the WARF runs are pretty good. Uh, they're not as good as the HRRR, but they're pretty good and worth looking at. Uh, COAMPS was one of the first mesoscale models that we widely used in US coastal waters. It's still running. It's not nearly as good as the HER. Um, the access especially Axis C, which is a high resolution mesoscale model for Australia, is, is probably the best model for the Sydney Hobart race, particularly picking the tough decisions of how to approach Tasman Island. And then in Europe, you've got a Rome, Arpege, here Lam. Some rules of thumb with mesoscale data, never use old mesoscale data. Some of the mesoscale models will run out 36 hours, but they run off the rails you know, somewhere between 6 and 12 hours, in, in my experience. And so it, you always want to be sure to get the more recent updates of the mesoscale data. You want to watch all the models and compare them to reports so you can figure out if you have multiple choices. You can figure out which ones are the ones to use. And that's really the challenge of races like the Hobart race, is as you're approaching Tasman Island, you have to have made your choice of which is the mesoscale model that you're going to bet on. And then you have to bet on it. But you got to make that decision wisely. And the only way you can make that decision wisely is to watch them over the previous day or so and figure out which one is nailing it. And in my experience, there's always been one that's got it nailed. Often, it's PWE or the uh, Access C. Um, mesoscale models, you can never tell when they're going off the rails by looking at them, unless you're comparing to real performance. Because they always look reasonable. 
and you look at a mesoscale model and you say, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen that pattern, you know, that looks completely reasonable, but they always look reasonable, it's just they don't correspond with what actually is gonna happen. So you have to uh, be careful with mesoscale models because when they go wrong, they never look wrong. And then don't break racing rule 41. Use free sources unless the SIs have changed the rules. This is, um, this is an example that Joe worked with me on. But this is the start of the last transpac. And the wind barbs are coming from the HRRR that actually I downloaded on Comanche. So this is the actual data you know, stored on Comanche. And then I have a friend, Lance Burke, who overlaid it on the high resolution satellite imagery, some of which we've got from Joe. And then it was also overlaid on the tracks of the, act of the boats in the fleet. And it's an extraordinarily complicated pattern. There's, this is the Catalina Eddy. This is what you hate to see for a transpac because it it's a, makes it into a huge challenge to get from the start into the synoptic wind. Um, and there are times during this Catalina Eddy where if you count, I think Joe counted up four or five different circulations. And normally, this is such a difficult situation that when I thought there was a Catalina Eddy, all I could do was to try to charter a small plane and fly it the evening before, before it got dark, and then try to fly it again at dawn, the day of the start, to try to figure it out. But it was terribly complicated. Nowadays, the HRR, as you can see from this overlay, it's not absolutely perfect, but it's astonishingly close to being perfect. And the right answer now for the transpac is to download the HRRR model every hour and believe it. And just bet on it. And that turned out to have been the right answer here. But it's, um, but literally you can see I think four different centers of, of um, you know, four different eddies of circulating flow in this area that's really only 150 miles across. So it's one of the most complicated areas of local weather that I think I've ever run across. And oceanography. Pardon me? And the oceanography. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Current models. When the major models and the experts agree, then you can take it to the bank. Um, and the wind and the current therefore is more dependable than the wind models because the current changes more slowly. On the other hand, um, when the models don't agree, then you struggle to pick which one's right. And then I think the right answer for me is you don't trust any of them if there's no agreement between the experts and the models. If you're on a fast boat, it doesn't matter that much. And it's really important on a fast boat to work out and answer the question of how much does it matter by running your routes with and without current. Because it's really a common mistake for navigators of big boats to make is to invest too many miles betting on the current when there, was no, well, there wasn't that much uptide, upside to it because you weren't gonna be in the eddy for that long. You try to find ground truth verification, and that would be you know, talking to one of the you know, cruising boat advisors who's been routing boats that are doing deliveries. Try to find somebody that's been advising somebody bringing boats back from Bermuda to find out whether that eddy really is where the models say it is, but it's rare that you can get actual ground truth. Occasionally you can find a ship and you can follow a ship on marine traffic as they go through an eddy. But ground truth is huge if you can find it. And then you scale the models to 130%, and that's just an empirical estimate of mine that seems to work. But all the models seem to underestimate by about that amount. That's Frank's chart in the lower right. Current model examples, there's the RTOFS, which as far as I can tell is the same as HICOM. Is that right, Frank? There's the Mercator. Both have about the same resolution. Um, Tide Tech is a professional service that mostly seems to use Mercator. There's Frank, Jennifer Clark, Leonard Wallstadt. Um, but again, if they all agree, you can take it to the bank. If they all disagree, you don't know what to do. And so in that case, you don't spend many miles um, believing any of them if they all disagree because you don't know where to pick. The graphic on the right is an interesting case from this last Sydney Hobart race. 
They were forecast, though, first of all, RTOFS and Mercator agreed dramat disagreed dramatically. So I was very skeptical of the current. The current, the forecast showed this big eddy. Most of the maxis sailed the course to take advantage of this favorable current. But if you ran the routes without current, you discovered that there was huge wind advantages to be further offshore because it was going to get really light in here. And then when the breeze filled in, it was going to be far better off to be offshore. And so what I did is I hedged out here thinking, well, I don't have any confidence that this eddy is where it's forecast to be because the models all disagree. But just in case it's right, I'm not going to go so far offshore as I'm going to be stemming the tide. But what I will do is I'll go far enough offshore so that it's, I'm kind of neutral in the tide. And then as it happened, you see these blue arrows. Those are the measured current that we measured on Comanche. And so you can see that this eddy was actually down about here. And we actually got favorable current. And so the rest of the maxis actually sailed in much less good wind in order to optimize for current that wasn't there. And I didn't know where it was, but I wasn't willing to sail a less good course because I knew I didn't know where it was, and we got lucky. So we sailed the course for better wind and ended up with better current also. So it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> Sea state matters on multi-hulls and fast monohulls. Um, that's a picture of a PlayStation. The sea state models, the WW3, Wind Wave 3, and the, I'm not sure how you'd pronounce it, MIFWAM or something, that's modeled off of the ECMWF. And sea state models have an interesting property, which is they're extraordinarily accurate. And I think that's because the sea state models are kind of a low pass filter on the big global models. And the physics is relatively well known. But nevertheless, the global models, you know, they can waft around a little bit and have some errors in them. But the C state models end up being extremely good. Um, but it doesn't much matter on heavier and slower monohulls. But for a fast, lightweight monohull or for a multi-hull, it's helpful to have tables of the effect of the swell size and angle relative to the boat the effects of the wind wave size and angle relative to the boat, and the effects of the angle between the swell and the wind waves independent of the angle of the boat. And the reason for that is you can have wind waves off your starboard quarter that would have no effect on you, and you can have a swell off your port quarter that would have no effect on you. But if those two patterns are crossing at 90 or 120 degrees, they can throw up columns of water. And in a multi-hull, now you're striking your front beam and you have to slow down. And so you kind of need to monitor both the wind waves and the swell and the angle between the two of them separately for the high-performance multi-hulls. This is an example of why it matters. This is the second stupidest thing I've ever done on a sailboat. But this was an attempt on PlayStation to try to set the cross-channel record. Take a look at this sea state. Obviously, it was not a successful <laughs> attempt. S astonishingly, the boat survived. Um, you can see how much wind there is here. And PlayStation was a bit of a struggle because it took a ton of wind to make her go. But she still needed flat water. Watch the, watch the Solent stay here. <laughs> OK, preparation using historical weather. And this is an interesting thing to do. But it turns out that both the ECMWF and the GFS, when you get a forecast, you get time slots. And the time slots are, you know, we call them the H0, H6, H12, H18. That's the number of hours from the synoptic time at which the measurements were made from which the forecast was based. And when you get a GFS run, you typically get access to that run four and a half or five hours after the H0 time, which is the time slot where the data was measured. But if you forecast the data, you can ask for and you can get the H0 data. So that was the weather four hours ago. So most people, it doesn't matter once you're you know, thinking about a future race. But the interesting thing is it's extremely accurate. 
that estimate of what the initialization was, meaning what the state of the weather was for that H0 time, which was four hours before you got the forecast. But what you can do is you can go back and you can get from NOAA what all of those H0 time slots were for the last 15 years everywhere in the world, and you can build a grid file from it. And that grid file, it's astonishingly accurate. And so if you finish a race and you go back and you look through the weather for that race made up of the sort of the combination of the H0 time slots from the forecast, it's um, sort of spine tingling how accurate that weather data is. It's extraordinary. So what can you use that for? Well, for a scheduled race, you know, like the next Bermuda race, you can take different configurations of your boat. You can run them. What I typically do is I'll run them 11 days per year for the last 15 years. So five days before the start day, the start day, the calendar start day, and then five days after. So 11 days per year for 15 years or 165 routes. And then you run different configurations of the boats and then you can analyze the statistics, the percentage of time on different points of sail, the percentage of time on wind speeds. You can analyze the scoring systems for defects and you can plot an overlay of the routes to understand the highway. So in the case of the Bermuda race, the highway is pretty straightforward, but in the case of you know, the first leg of the Volvo, the highway is important you know, to understand typically how far you have to go around you know, the St. Helena High. And I'll get to the highway later as to why it's important to have that data. If you're trying to optimize a departure time, and that doesn't make sense for a scheduled race, but optimizing a departure time makes sense if you're trying to set a record or if you're trying to do a delivery. What I'll do is you, is, you know, run a route every six hours for 15 years to understand the options if it's a difficult um, record. And if it's a case of a cruise, if you're trying to find the best departure time over the next week, you know, run a route every four hours you know, over the course of the next week. And you'll see if there's a particularly good time to you know, leave Panama if you're heading north to Cuba. And there often is, and it's often worth just waiting two or three days, but at least you'll know when it is. So this is an example of the research that I did for Comanche to set the transatlantic record. And what we pioneered on Groupama and PlayStation before that was the concept of doing a transatlantic record where you would start in front of a major storm. You'd start in the warm sector, and then you'd sail all the way across the ocean in the southwesterly ahead of a major storm. And obviously, the, the boat, if you had to go slow, or if I picked a storm that was too fast, it was going to get ugly. But nevertheless, if it worked, you were in that gorgeous weather in front of a storm, you know, flat water, you know, sort of drizzly and gray, but you know, beautiful sailing conditions to you know, beam reach all the way across in a southwester. Well, on Comanche, the challenge was nobody had ever done that on a monohull. We were the first to do it on multi-hulls, but the question was, can, a, can you find a storm that's slow enough for a monohull to stay ahead of? So what I did was routed Comanche every six hours, June through November for 11 years, and created 8,000 routes, and discovered that on average, twice a year, there was a storm that was slow enough for Comanche to stay ahead of it. But I knew exactly what they looked like because I now had you know, 20 examples of this. And what it looked like to me, and I'm sure the professional meteorologist would describe it very different, but what it looked like to me was a big storm that was strong enough to make it all the way to England, but it was gonna stop because there was something that looked like a coal off of Newfoundland. And so what that storm would do is it would start rumbling and then it would stop right about here for about a day and a half. And then it would continue rumbling and it would make it all the way across. And if you picked a storm that was too small, you could pick slow ones, but they didn't make it all the way to the English Channel. And a lot of these records you know, would fail just shy of the English Channel. So you needed a big, strong storm, but you needed a storm that was gonna slow down and give you a chance to get back ahead of it. So we found, we figured out what we were looking for. We found an example and it worked perfectly. We set the record, we took 24 hours off the previous monohull record and we almost didn't take any pictures because the trip across was boring. I mean, we sailed for five days and the biggest wave we saw was 18 inches. <laughs> so, 
This is the track we actually sailed. This is the data off of Comanche, and you can see it couldn't be easier. You know, a southwesterly, you know, all the way across. No tacks, no jibes. We hardly even reefed or unreefed. It was just, um, you know, literally a very boring passage. Um, and this is the theoretical track that was run on the H0 data after the case, and that came out within 20 minutes of the actual track. This is the last Sydney Hobart race on Comanche, and this is an, also an example. The black track is what we actually sailed, and the blue track is what you get if you take the H0 data and then after the fact, based on the H0 data, you recompute the optimum route. And the interesting thing was, and it's, I think it's more coincidence than it is skill, but the time and route came out within three minutes between the theoretical track on the H0 data and our actual track in the race. So that was, I think, dominated by coincidence. But it also shows that the H0 data is good and our polars are quite good. The other interesting thing was that at the time we were calling this ley line, which is a long ley line, um, I was not using the GFS data because the GFS data wasn't great at that point. I was using the axis C, which is mesoscale. But then in the H0 um, version of it, the GFS nailed it. And so it showed our ley line as being exactly right, which in fact it was. So the H0 data is a powerful tool to um, to analyze after the fact, to understand if you and your crew left any miles on the race course, but also to compute beforehand so you can understand the conditions you're racing in. And the interesting thing about that is we don't race boats in average conditions. That's a mistake that a lot of people make. They say, well, let's just look at the climatological information for a Bermuda race. Well, you never sail in that race. What you sail in is lots of different races. And so you got to understand the percentage of time at different points of sail in all of those different races rather than the average race, which nobody's ever experienced. Routing overview. Always do an eyeball route first. You've heard that earlier today. Um, one of the guys said that. Uh, David said that. Yeah, you always do an eyeball route first. Just looking at the synoptic chart, then looking at the gribs, but not running a route. You write down your conclusions and you write down your questions. But you, you're really looking at it with an open mind when you're just looking at the synoptic chart and looking at the gribs and thinking, okay, it looks like you gotta be the first one to get to that front and then you tack and et cetera. You um, consider your course selection as risk adjusted investing. Extra miles sailed is your currency. So you invest those miles wisely. We all know the minimum distance course, you know, that would be the great circle. Well, any mile extra you sail over that minimum distance, you're investing that mile with an expectation of getting to the finish enough earlier than it took to sail that extra mile. So your currency is miles, and that's what you're gonna spend, and you're investing them with the expectation of this return that's more than the mile invested. And you have to think through that very carefully. Sometimes you, if you have a lead, you can invest extra miles to hedge risks to cover your competitors. If you're sailing in a one design class like a Volvo and you have a 12 hour lead, well, you might be willing to invest nine of those hours so you have a 100% chance of beating your competitors to the finish. Um, you might be willing to invest them all if you had a 100% chance, but you, you don't know, so you have to weigh the risks. Um, I've had the good pleasure to navigate professionally on boats owned by Nolan Bushnell, Roy Disney, Steve Fawcett, Richard Branson, Larry Ellison, Neville Crichton, Jim Clark. These are all billionaires. They're all arguably very good at risk-adjusted investing. And I found them to have extraordinary insight in this area. And whenever it's rough, I find these guys sitting next to me at the nav station. And so I'll often sort of bring them into my world and you know, pose them the problems that I'm dealing with. Say, so, okay, you know, here's a course, but it's a lot longer, but it's only a few minutes faster. And they have really good instincts about you know, what questions to ask and how to think about it based on where you are on the race course and where your competitors are. Um, I found it's always helpful to warn the skipper and crew 
far in advance about the need to make a large investment of miles. So in the case of the Volvo, out of the nine legs, there's four legs where I think I had to warn my crew on AB and AMRO, you know, here's the deal, we're leading the leg, but I'm gonna have to sail us into last place in the standings in order to purchase the fastest course to get us to the finish first. And so, you know, the, even the first leg, there's a situation where we're, you know, we're sailing out to the trades and I say, I need to be the last boat to jibe because I need to be the furthest west boat on our track down the South Atlantic. And so I'm gonna have to sail us into last place. And of course, you give these guys, you know, they're whinging about it and they're asking you if you're serious and eventually you kind of get them all convinced and then when it works, um, you couldn't have done it without them understanding in advance that you have to make that kind of a frightening and risky investment. But at least they knew about it ahead of time. The scary thing about the Volvo was by the time it came to the fourth time of doing it, I would tell the guys, here's the deal, I gotta sail this in. And they'd say, yeah, 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 do whatever you want. <laughs> and I'd say, no guys, this is serious. <laughs> um, if you can't explain a route or tactics in sailing terms, you don't understand it. And this is the hardest thing to teach about navigation to young kids, is you'll ask a kid, well, why are we doing this? And the kid will say, well, you know, we're on the optimum track. And you say, really? Well, why is that the optimum track? And they'll say, oh, I don't know. You know, the computer thinks. You know, the computer's really smart, and it's got good models, and it's got polars, and it's got to be right. You say, well, no, figure it out. Why is that the optimum track? And eventually you can force the kid into doing experiments and turning the current off and turning the current on and moving weather systems faster or slower. And eventually they'll say, well, actually it's pretty simple. You know, there's more current there and you know, we're just trying to be the first ones to the current. And then you say, well, so then why aren't we on the wind right now? And they'll think through, oh shit, we should be. <laughs> because you really need to understand, when the router comes up with a track, you really need to understand why that's the optimum track. And if you can't explain it in sailing terms to a skilled sailor, then you don't understand it. And you have to keep running experiments and tinkering until you understand it. And it's never complicated. You just have to understand it. Weather-related re routing tips. The GFS, and I think this is true of the ECMWF as well, but the GFS underestimates wind speed associated with small features like new lows, tropical lows, and fronts. And it dramatically underestimates their speed. And if you ask technical guys like Joe, why is that? He'll say, well, if they try to fix that, the whole model becomes unstable. So it's just a known characteristic of the GFS. So if you see a tropical on the GFS and it shows that it's blowing 35 knots, it means you're gonna die. <laughs> so what you have to do, and that's the best use of the text forecast, if you see a tropical on GFS, you go to the text forecast from the Hurricane Center, and then you see what they say, and they'll give you the different distances, you know, the parameters of the high winds and all of that. But that's a known defect of the GFS, and we just have to, to live with it. You have to scale the GFS up to correspond to the winds that we sail in. So the GFS is at 10 meters. Most of us who navigate professionally scale our instruments to read out the velocity at 25 meters. And we do that just to save time because most professional sailors are used to masthead instruments at 25 meters because that's what TP-52s have. And so if you're on a small boat and you're letting it read out at 10 meters, all of the sailors are saying it's under reading. If you're in a maxi and you let it read out at, you know, at 160 feet off the water, all the sailors will be complaining all the time that it's over reading. So in order to save time, I always scale the instruments to read out at 25 meters, because then it looks right. Um, the grib files come at 10 meters, so if your polars are organized for 25 meters, you need to scale them up, but even if your polars are organized at 10 meters, you still need to scale them up. So to scale it, to run everything at 25 meters, you need to scale the GFS like 125% in high latitudes, like the Southern Ocean, 115 in mid latitudes, 110 in the trades. And then if you're running your boat at 10 meters, which very few people do, 
you'd still need to scale the polar, the GFS up by about 115% in the high latitudes and 105% in the mid latitudes, and none at all in the trades. But the GFS, you do need to scale it up some. The routes from Expedition or any other router will always take you too close to a high. And it's not because of a defect in the GFS, and it's not because of a defect in the router, and it's not because your polars aren't right. Everything's perfect. And if you do a delivery and you go right through the Pacific High, you'll realize that the GFS is extraordinary. It has it exactly right. So why does the router always take you too close to the high? Well, the answer is the same as if you ask the router to tell you the quickest way to walk around the Grand Canyon, the router would say, right on the very edge. You know, one foot in front of the other on the very edge. Well, as a practical matter, you wouldn't do that because if you just took one false step, you'd fall in. So you know that that's not practical. Well, it's the same thing. What the router is doing is it's saying, okay, here's your polars, here's the high. This is the optimum course. But as a practical matter, you sail under a cloud and it gets light, so the sailors have to go up a little bit. The spinnaker collapses, it gets light, you have to come up a little bit. Every time you go up a little bit, you're now a little bit closer. The wind's a little lighter, so you have to sail a little bit higher still. And pretty soon you spin out into the high. So the router did the job perfectly, but nevertheless, that's not the real world. The real world has light spots. And every time you hit a light spot, you're having to sail higher than the router thought. And pretty soon you're closer to the high than you thought, and then you're sailing higher still, and then it all goes bad. So you have to use human judgment about going around a high. And the going around a high, it's one of the most interesting things for a navigator. And it's one of the most difficult things. And for the Volvo race, where you have to go around five different highs in the process of going around the world, it's, I think, the thing that the navigators like the best, because it's the hardest, and it's the, um, it's the most perilous in terms of making a mistake. Because if you get close to a high too soon, there's no exit. Because you have to jibe out before you got enough of a wind shift to jibe out on a good angle. So you're having to jibe out at a terrible angle, or you dig into the high and you spend your rest of your life there. So, it's a, so there's no escaping that mistake. So it's a fascinating problem. Routing software goes all in for the tiniest of gains, and that's a terrible risk-adjusted investment. And I'll give you an example of that. Let's say that there was a, you're going to cross an ocean, then a miracle occurs, and it's absolutely steady conditions, except there's a one-degree shift. Well, what is the router going to do? It's going to go all the way to the corner for that one-degree shift. Now, as a practical matter, we know that that's a terrible solution because the weather forecast is going to change, and you will be totally committed for this one-degree shift, which is a six-minute advantage. But the router's decided, you know, Cornersville, that's where it's going. Whereas you know that if it's really an even situation, you want to be tacking up the middle because there's going to be the completely unforecast, you know, shifts that come through as the lines of clouds come through. So you got to be really careful to make sure you understand how much you're investing and why. And in this case, the mistake is the router is going to totally commit you to one side of the course for a tiny gain. And therefore, you're locked in from any further updates in the weather that you'd want to take advantage of or any non-forecast events where you need flexibility. You always have to have the highway in mind. So let's say you're crossing an ocean. It's a 15-day route. And you say, cool, the GFS runs for 15 days. I'm good. I just download the GFS, and I run the route, and we're good to go. Well, the problem is the router um, assigns the same certainty to a weather feature that's 10 days in the future as it does to a weather feature that's six hours in the future. And we know as humans that that's crazy. A weather feature that's 10 days in the future is totally fiction. It may never happen. In fact, in many cases, they do evaporate. So what, you, so what do you do? You're crossing an ocean. It's going to be a 15-day trip. Where do you go? Well, the answer is you put a waypoint in that's five, mile, that's five days ahead of you, but it's on the highway. And the highway is the typical path of routes on that leg of the course in that season. 
And then every six hours when you're rerunning your analysis, you step your aiming point forward. And then you work your way across. But you never spend an extra mile. You never invest one of your currency miles in dealing with a feature that's eight days in the future. That's crazy. Always work out the free advance of the motorboat course. What does that mean? So if you could stop, pick up the boat, and move it in any direction for 10 miles, and put it back in the water, which way would you move it? It's almost never the way the boat's going now. You know, it might be dead upwind. It might be dead downwind if it's a run. In a case like the Transpac, it's, it's none of those. It's not necessarily where you're pointing now, and it sure as heck isn't dead downwind or dead upwind. But you need to know what that course is. And the crew on deck needs to know what that course is. And the way you can figure it out is you can look at the reverse isochrons on your router, and you can take a perpendicular to the reverse isochron. But you need to know what it is, because things happen. You get a squall that comes through. Suddenly, the boat's on a beam reach. Most crews, when faced with that situation, they'll just keep going straight, because they don't know what else to do. But if your crew has been briefed as part of your four-hour updates on what the free advance course is, then as soon as they get that squall, bam, the guys on deck do exactly the right thing. And they go to that course, which is your, you know, the fastest way to cross the ladder line, the fastest way to cross your reverse isochron lines. And so it's just hugely valuable in your own thinking and also for the performance of the guys on deck for them to always know what's the free advance course. Have your own achievable nav polars. A lot of navigators, especially new ones, make the mistake of using the targets as their polars. For the routing to work, you actually have to be, be able to get to where the, the router thinks you're going to get to you know, three or four days in the future. So you have to actually have achievable polars. So you always have two different sets of polars. You have one set of polars that's the boat's ideal performance and is used for the targets for the guys on deck. And then you have another set, which is the boat's average performance, day in, day out, best helmsman, not so good helmsman, sail changes, stuff going wrong. But on average, you can sail around the world and be there. And that's what you need to use for your routing. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay. Um, routing software. Um, Expedition is the best choice overall, setting aside cost. It is a little pricey. It has good routing. It has good fleet tracking. It has good viewing of the weather. It's also a great tool for inshore racing and for it has a good starting tool. So, you know, across the use in all of sailboat racing, I think Expedition is the best tool. It has a familiar Windows interface. Adrena is a French program. It's got good weather viewing. The routing is OK. It's very good for routing based on sea state. So if you're, race, if you're routing a multi-hull, it has very good tools for the putting in those tables of the effects of sea state. It's very good for route research, comparing routes and understanding them. It's got a familiar Windows interface. It's slow compared to Expedition. And speaking French helps. <laughs> Um, they, there is an English version of the documentation, but it's often not as clear and a little bit out of date. Um, Deckman for Windows is very good for long, complex ley lines. Um, but at this point, it's so hostile that I wouldn't suggest that anybody learn it who doesn't already know it. Random tips. When you're facing the shore, if the wind is blowing along the shore from right to left, the wind will go all the way into the shore. And so it's safe to tack right on in. When you're facing the shore, if the wind is blowing from left to right, there will be a band of light air along the shore. And that's in the northern hemisphere. And this comes from Ken's description of convergent. The, this shoreline is a convergent shoreline. Because the wind is blowing from right to left along the shore. The wind over the land is slower, so it shifts to the left. The wind along the water is not slower, so that it's going straight, so the wind is converging. And so that's why you'll find wind all the way in next to the bricks. In this case, it's a divergent shoreline, because the wind along the shore is left shifted, and it's diverging from the wind along 
the water. The first sign of sea breeze is not the often, the common anecdote of the cumulus clouds inshore over the mountain range. The first sign of a sea breeze is the horizon gets more distinct offshore. The cumulus clouds don't happen inshore till after the sea breeze is already starting to happen. If the dew dries on deck at night, or if you smell hay, the land breeze is approaching, and you have to decide immediately whether to dig in to take advantage of the land breeze or whether to escape out. And that decision has to be made on where you want to be the next morning. You know, if you're working your way into the finish and the race finishes at noon the next day, well, you dig in because you can finish the race in the land breeze. If, on the other hand, you need to continue on down the coast for a day or two, you probably want to escape out. So you, because the transition the next day is going to be hugely painful. On the other hand, if there is no synoptic breeze, the land breeze may be all you got. So you dig in and do the best you can and then, you know, fight another day the next day. But nevertheless, if the dew dries on deck, you have to decide immediately. You just have a few minutes to spare. If the temperature at 850 millibars is not seven degrees cooler than on the surface, there's no hope for a sea breeze. Um, this is information that you can pull out of the NOAA Ready site. Um, more recently, CAPE is very useful. So what I'll do is you go and you look at what the CAPE index is inland. And if it looks like it's going to be unstable in the afternoon, that's also a really good predictor of a, a sea breeze. Um, this is the most important one. In a sea state, you know, you've heard a lot about waves today from Frank and others. But in a sea state, you take the swell and the wind waves, add them up, multiply times two and a half, and never sail in water that's shallower than that. And that's how those people were killed in the Farallons race. And there were CCA members that sailed in shallower water than that after that boat got driven ashore. And the problem with sailing in shallower water than that, if you watch the surf line and you say, OK, that's OK, well, you might get away with it. But there's a 1 in 100 chance that there's going to be a big set that forms up outside you, and you're going to kill somebody. So it's never worth the chance. And in the Farallons race, you know, you're just going around one shallow spot. But you know, the whole west coast, we're on a lee shore. So we all are having to decide how close to go to shore. You know, beating around Britain and Ireland, you have to make that decision hundreds of times. So having a rule of thumb that you memorize, so you never go around a headland that's a lee shore based on looking for where the, sea, the seas are breaking. Instead, what you do is you look at the size of the seas, and then you go to the chart and you put in a waypoint. And you say, OK, that's the shallowest water I'm willing to sail in. And this is, this is something as, I guess it has to do with this seminar because we're talking about sea state and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But this is a lost skill. I mean, I remember my father was far more fearful of lee shores than almost any young sailors are today. And so this is a really important thing. OK. Finally. When I was uh, growing up as a kid sailing in LA Yacht Club, Shorty Alderman was the caretaker who hated kids. <laughs> but occasionally, we could talk him into telling us stories of going around the horn when he was the second mate on the Falls of Clyde. Oh, and great. this was his advice. Keep your head warm, your feet dry, your eyes open, and your mouth shut. <laughs> and then for the Caribbean, get bigger ground tackle and avoid the naked women. So that's got to be good advice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>